So hello everyone, I'm Alistair Donald, uh, Associate Director at Academy of Ideas and the co-convener of this festival. This session is called What is the Blob? If you think you're here for a discussion about a 1950s sci-fi movie, then you're probably in the wrong room. I've, I've just been chairing a session on populism and one of the things that kept coming up was people asking for a definition of populism and perhaps the blob is kind of a little bit like that and people have uh, a, a varying uh, interpretations of what it is and what it means. So hopefully we can clarify uh, some of these things in the next hour or so. Uh, some of the questions that I was thinking might be useful to uh, ask and try and understand a little bit more is, is this just something where we're clumping together ranges of experts and political actors and civil society institutions? And is that helpful? Is it accurate? Is it in any way useful. Has the civil service uh, really been captured in the way that lots of people uh, tend to assert that it has been? Or is this just a kind of latest manifestation of some sort of conspiratorial thinking? Uh, to what extent is the blob a convenient scapegoat, really, for politicians uh, to deflect from their own failures? Uh, and if a notional blob does, in reality, present some sort of resistance to a process of change, then what are the steps that we could take in order to challenge it? This session has been produced by Rashiba Haria, who's uh, in the audience somewhere, Rush. Uh, so I just want to give a bit of credit where it's due because a lot of the thinking that's gone into uh, developing the uh, framework for the discussion has not been me. I'm just here chairing it, but it's been done by Rush. Uh, so thanks to you, Rush, for, for, for doing that. So let me introduce in the order that they're going to speak our speakers. So on my immediate left, we've got Nick Bosveen, OBE. He's a consultant, founding partner of Herminius Holdings. Uh, he's an advisory board member of Briefings for Britain, who you can find on the internet and always producing interesting stuff. Uh, he, and he's a former diplomat at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Next, we'll hear from Poppy Coburn on my uh, immediate uh, right. Poppy is assistant comment editor at the Daily Telegraph and a co-editor of the Conservative Reader. Then, on my far left, we'll hear from Professor Bill DeRodi. Uh, he's Chair of International Relations at the Department of Politics and Languages and International Studies at the University of Bath. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Ian Atchison, who's a Senior Advisor uh, for the Counter-Extremism Project and a Visiting Professor of School of Law policing and forensics at the University of Staffordshire. So could we give them all a warm welcome, please? <laughs> I'm sure you're used to the format by now. They're going to speak for about five minutes. I'll be fairly tough on the timing, so I'll tell them to wind up after five minutes. Uh, and then it's going to be out straight out to you for your questions and comments, and we can get a discussion going that way. So uh, over to you, Nick. Uh, thanks very much, Alistair. Um, hello. I'm Nick, and I'm an ex-member of The Blob. Uh, <clears throat> the film The Blob offered us a vision of something invasive, glutinous, uniform, suffocating, all-encompassing, and decidedly unpleasant. Um, and on the subject of science fiction, um, I'm also tempted to quote The Borg, resistance is futile. Uh, but seriously, for me, the key defining cr criteria for The Blob are public funding and accountability or rather the absence of accountability. If we judge that politicians have failed us, we can throw them out at elections. But the blob for me are those people who are paid for by the taxpayer and who exert significant influence on public policy making, but who remain essentially anonymous and out of reach. In other words, civil servants, quangocrats, regulators, health service leaders, and so on. The backdrop to this debate, and I think it's emerged in other debates today, I guess, is a, a palpable and growing sense of public concern uh, that the outcomes of our public policy process are, to be blunt, poor. Policy and regulatory mistakes in the run-up to the global financial crisis, failure to properly weigh potential lockdown harms during COVID, failure to manage illegal immigration, NSA, NHS management failures behind the Lucy Letby child murder scandal, Bank of England money printing in inflation, the mind-blowing cost of the taxpayer associated with HS2, effective planning and honesty around the transition to net zero. The list goes on and on. And as countries the world over are now discovering, 
the ability to paper over poor decision-making and policy cracks with dollops of debt-based funding is becoming dramatically more expensive and unaffordable. Government policymaking is the product, in theory, uh, of the interplay between elected politicians and their impartial officials. So if Labour, or maybe when Labour is elected next year, blob competence will be of immediate and compelling concern for them. I worry that changes in the culture of the civil service that began in the 1990s have seen a progressive decline in departmental effectiveness. Blob leaders these days may still think they're really good, but judged on the basis of delivery, they look, with a few notable exceptions, either a bit mere or significantly worse. Um, civil service leaders continue to argue that they should not be held accountable because that is not how our democratic system functions. But this only works if certain key cried conditions are fulfilled. And the key conditions are that the blob is both impartial and effective. But uh, what happens if it isn't impartial and effective and when things go wrong? Uh, remember too, uh, it is publicly funded officials, not ministers, who are directly responsible for the culture, capability and delivery of their respective organisations. However unsympathetic one might be for politicians, it is hard to see why they should take all the blame for failing to deliver on their manifesto promises when they're up against entrenched hostility or unacceptable levels of incompetence from their own supposedly impartial officials and publicly funded bodies. So here are some um, defining characteristics of the blob, which I think are undermining effectiveness. Uh, number one, the triumph of process over delivery. Process and proper planning are essential, but when process becomes a career building end in itself, it becomes destructive. We now regularly see blob leaders claiming equality, diversity and inclusion outcomes in place of core departmental delivery targets. This looks like costly and wasteful displacement activity. As one recently uh, retired official told me last year, if the unmeritocratic woke HR policy that my department is currently applying continues, the department as a whole will fail to deliver what taxpayers expect and will be wholly irrelevant in 10 to 15 years. A second uh, criteria, I think, is groupthink. Those of us who served in Iraq are more keenly aware of the perils of groupthink than most. Um, despite having a bad name, it's still there. For all the talk of the importance of diversity, there is a tendency to self-select people like us for leadership posts. The danger is that we end up with a uniform leadership group who tick all the same HR boxes and who all share the same outlook. This does not necessarily lead to good appointments and undermines the internal challenge function essential to effective decision making. Then there's loss of impartiality. We've seen multiple examples of civil servants gunning for Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and various other cabinet ministers in recent years. On Brexit, most civil servants hated it and have not been shy about saying so. There is also a non-impartial political dimension to wokery, which has really embedded itself in the blob. The truth of it is, I'm afraid, that identity politics and impartiality are not compatible. Finally, and perhaps most concerning, disdain for democracy. Again, brought to the fore by Brexit. Put simply, many in the blob appear to be deeply suspicious of bottom-up democracy. Churchill's dictum, trust the people, seems to be anathema to many in our ruling class. Post-Brexit, we seem to be witnessing a determined campaign to shift as much executive power as possible away from politicians and into the hands of unaccountable technocrats, multilateral institutions, as well as the courts. Long experience of working overseas tells me that growing and unaccountable blobs are not a good thing for democracy, freedom, or prosperity. So to conclude, what of the future? Don't touch our wonderful civil service and quangocrats, we're told. But Labour's effectively done it with the appointment of Sue Gray as Keir Starmer's chief of staff. I'm sorry, uh, but to me, Gray's decision to flirt with Labour while writing the report that would bring down a Conservative Prime Minister makes an utter mockery of civil service impartiality. The concept to which I held true throughout my career has been buried by Labour and we should not pretend otherwise. We can no longer avoid consideration of civil service reform 
Former Cabinet Office Minister Francis Maud is conducting a review, and it'll be interesting to see what he recommends. Uh, and finally, I think we badly need a more developed debate on the relationship and balance of power between our elected politicians and our unaccountable blob. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lots of things to think about. Poppy. Thank you. I think it's unfortunate that the blob is the term we've settled on to describe this network of uh, anti-democratic processes at the heart of government, not because it is a, a kind of a slightly unpleasant or conspiratorial term, but because it doesn't quite carry the weight of just how serious this network is. And I'd like to start by giving um, a little definition of, of what I personally perceive the blob to be and then give my own alternative name that I prefer for it. So I think at the heart, this is a process of hollowing out political accountability and by extension legitimacy, and it sits at the heart of the British state. It's a network, an ecosystem in which everybody operates with a similar set of similar superficial assumptions about the legitimate domain of state action, derived from similar assumptions, and I would say misconceptions about human nature. I would call this not the blob, but government by stakeholder. So what do we have to show for the last 13 years of conservative government? That's the most obvious rejoinder somebody would give to the opposition to the idea of the blob or the stakeholder state. Of all the shortcomings of the Conservative Party in the last 13 years, the repeated failure to use their respective mandates to tear out anti-democratic funding and power flows that exist within the heart of the state is probably the worst. We can just give one example of it here through the example of immigration. The government has been funding charities which oppose its flagship refugee policy in Rwanda, while also attempting to push it through the courts. The government has, since 2017, given over £50 million to charities fighting the scheme. One example of these would be Migrant Help, and it's an organisation that was embroiled in the recent failures at the Manston Processing Centre. It's received £65 million from central government in the last five years, while also government spending has fallen on immigration enforcement by £43 million. Attitudes within the party have changed pretty dramatically over these 13 years of governance. In fact, quite in favour, um, initially Cameron was quite in favour of this idea of the blob. Um, Cameroonism was characterised by hesitant optimism about markets, broadly, broadly favourable attitudes towards the state, the idea of the gov good the government can do, and an uncritically positive view of these things in between. And that seems to kind of characterise general conservative consensus at the time. Ordinary MPs were abandoning their exercise for political reason, farming off policy to remote interest groups, campaigns and charities. Ministers had generally been, been unable to resist and unwilling to comply with their increasingly powerless positions. They become impotent, and from that impotence they had derived a principle. That is why the Home Secretary can call for reducing immigration without actually being able to deliver on any of the policies that are now that to happen. That is why the government is spending nearly £20 million every day funding an entire sector which seems to be weaponised against it. And that is why after 13 years of Conservative government, it is almost impossible to govern conservatively. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think we could come back to lots of those things, and I'm sure all the comments will produce uh, lots of questions in the audience. Um, where am I going next? Bill? Uh, yeah, in uh, October 2020, during Black History Month, Kemi Badenoch, the then Equalities Minister, gave quite a uh, well-known speech five months after the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and her speech in the House of Commons was to the effect that any school that teaches critical race theory in an unbalanced way as a proof, and quote her words, is breaking the law. Now, as we've already heard today, somebody pointing out, many schools have continued to do so. And indeed, in the immediate aftermath, within a month, the universities UK, although it's a slightly different education sector, uh, had sent out a piece of um, a, a report to its members asking them to focus on white privilege and white fragility. And so it continues. Um, the Rishi Sunak at the beginning of this year um, was charged with delivering guidance for schools on how to deal with trans pupils. Um, in July of this year, just as the draft of the report had emerged, 
He was notified by the Attorney uh, General that he uh, may be in breach of the Equalities Act were he to pursue the recommendations in the report, which were to the effect that parents ought to be notified if their children wanted to uh, be identified by a different gender in schools, that there should be facilities for single-sex toilets and changing rooms in schools, and there should be time for reflection for pupils um, before and transitioning. The point I'm making is Rishi Sunak, whether you like it or not, is the representative of the elected government of this country as the outcome of a general election. But he's basically being put on hold by uh, judicial procedures and judicial codes so that effectively a single person can decide whether uh, the prime minister can pursue what they want to pursue. And that begs the question, who rules? If it's not the ministers of the government, if it's not even the prime minister, who's actually in charge? Now, the point I want to really get across in these five minutes is that I don't view the blob uh, as either uh, a bunch of individuals who are particularly difficult in the civil service. I don't even think of them as a network. I think of it as a culture within which we are all in. And to reflect on that, I'm just going to give you two more examples, a little bit more dated. In 2015, during the uh, election that um, brought uh, David Cameron back into power um, against Ed Miliband for the Labour Party, the then Shadow Education Minister, Tristram Hunt, now Director of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, went on the campaign trail and he went to sit in a school in Derbyshire uh, and uh, was asking pupils who they might vote for if they had a vote in the general election. Now, the thing you have to understand is that Tristram Hunt, just a few months earlier, had had an opinion piece published in the independent newspaper um, to, to the effect of, to win the election, uh, why the Labour Party must confront and defeat UKIP. Sit next to a nine-year-old boy, said to him, who would you vote for if you had the opportunity? And the boy looked at him straight in the eye and says, uh, UKIP. Um, at which point, as you can imagine, he's slightly taken aback and says, oh, I see. And why is that? Uh, to which the answer comes, uh, because they'd kick all the foreigners out. Um, now Tristram Hunt is on the campaign trail. He's got the BBC East Midlands crew filming him. You would have thought this would be a perfect opportunity. Not to lay into a nine-year-old, because that's not big and clever, but maybe to make a couple of points about the great benefits that people from, you know, migrants have brought to this country, both economically, culturally, or in any other way that presumably appeared in his editorial. What I find amazing is his paralysis and his choice at that point to stand up and walk off. And my suggestion to you is because he does not know how to argue what he thinks he's arguing for. I mean, there comes a point where, um, you know, speeches are written for you. He may have written the speech, but if you don't rehearse your arguments and confront your opponent and learn how to win at every level of a debate, then you're kind of knowing inside you that you're morally right, but confronted by the fact that you don't have the intellectual tools to actually argue your own case. And I'm suggesting to you that this cultural sense of a sense is what the blob is. We're living now in a generation where lots of people think they're right. Um, and they then their inability to push through what they want to achieve. They then push onto external factors, whereas actually it's primarily internal ones. The last example I want to give, uh, as an academic is, um, a chap called Avinash Barua, who wrote a opinion piece for the Washington Post again in uh, 2015, and it was in the aftermath of Jihadi John, who was the guy decapitating people in orange jumpsuit in Iraq and Syria, uh, otherwise known as Mohammed Imwazi, had been outed. And uh, Avinash Daru writes a piece saying he was at the University of Westminster at the same time as Mohammed Imwazi, and he was not surprised at uh, the, how Mohammed Imwazi had come about because he recalls a story where a lecturer is giving a class a talk on democracy and a young girl in a hijab stands up and then says, well, you know, as a Muslim, I don't believe in democracy. 
The lecturer, as you can imagine, um, maybe, is equally paralyzed. He has a Tristram Hunt moment, doesn't know what to do. Is he going to offend someone for being a woman, for being a Muslim, both of those? Um, and so he completely backs up and shuts up. And that's the point that Abhinash Tharoor is making, that people are now paralyzed, unable to argue for what they think is correct. Again, it would have been straightforward to make lots of different points about their different types of democracy. Let's look at the pros and cons. Some Muslim countries are democratic. Um, but it's that inability to punch through it. So the point, uh, and I'll just finish on this, um, is that we are living in a time when we, there is a cultural um, environment where people fear causing offense, fear uh, confronting those they disagree with. And I think that's what politicians project onto the civil service when actually most of the time, you know, it's their own inabilities that they're confronted by. Okay. Um, Ian. Uh, I could just say what they said and go to questions, but uh, I've been asked to come here to bang on for a bit, so I will. And I also declare, like Nick, I am a recovered Mandarin as well. So welcome to the Battle of Ideas graveyard shift. Uh, so I too come to bury the blob and not to, to praise it. I remember as a kid watching the original film, the title of this debate takes its name from, and I, I found it terrifying. It genuinely did give me nightmares, this all-enveloping gelatinous mass that Dick has described that could squeeze it to any hiding place and suffocate and consume its prey, only growing bigger as a result and more unstoppable metaphors you know, abound. But is this a fair or accurate characterization of a coalition of allegedly progressive forces that stymies and devours Tory ministers? and jams up the gears of government? Or, you know, does such a malign coalition even exist? Or might it be a convenient proxy for ministerial uselessness? Uh, so, you know, I declare an interest because I'm probably a product of the, the liberal orthodoxy that is said to um, animate this blob, if emphatically not a cheerleader for it. Indeed, I'm a rather unlikely poster child for bourgeois anti-conservative sentiment, being a council house corner boy from an obscure loyalist housing estate in the west of Northern Ireland. But have I hold myself up the greasy pole of uh, public service on, on this side of the ditch over the last 25 years or so, I think I've probably something valid to say about whether this blob exists and what, if anything, could be done to tame it in the absence of uh, Steve McQueen. Uh, just Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, the first thing to be clear is that when public sector princelings like Cabinet Secretary Simon Case say the blob is dehumanising, you should be on alert. Much is made of the fact that our civil service, and we've heard it before here, an alleged key ingredient of the blob cannot answer its critics back. Moreover, we're, we're often told by Mandarin lobby groups, unions, and uh, leaders of the many quangos that owe their existence to the poor taxpayer that this country has a Rolls Royce administrative engine, which is poignantly stuck inside an Austin Allegro of conservative governments. Well, they don't always say the, the second bit uh, out loud, obviously. But there is without question within our uh, mediocrity, as I would call it, a powerful and toxic blend of resentment and entitlement, which might be excusable, I suppose, if we had a world-class public service productivity to go with it. But that follows, uh, to deploy a technical term, uh, everything from prison safety through infrastructure management to driving license renewal, and you heard a, a l larger charge sheet read earlier, is in seemingly irreversible decline in the Office for National Statistics has produced experimental data on public sector productivity uh, since the pandemic. And, uh, and while you know, private sector uh, performance is now to write home about, at least it's not going in reverse. But I mean, is any of that evidence still uh, of a cabal of elitist forces, you know, the unions, public servants, the boss class, bureaucrats, academics, working in a, a cahoots to oppose, frustrate, and as some even would have it bring down the democratically elected government. And I'm instinctively averse to conspiracy theories, so I'm going to say something less convenient here, I think. I, I just don't think there's the intellectual capacity lying around to prosecute this kind of Machiavellian takeover. So on my journey up through and beyond the, the senior civil service, I have encountered some really brilliant minds, but I have to say many more that would have trouble operating a flush toilet. So that's not to say there aren't deliberately obstructive people in senior and influential positions across the public service who dislike this government and who can and do work covertly to frustrate its objectives. But you know, bluntly, there are more dense people in charge, Olympic-class exemplars of the Peter Principle, than there were ever going to be any number of effective subversives. Quick example, I was Director of Community Safety at the Home Office 
for South West England by day, and I was also a volunteer police officer by night, uh, walking the mean streets of Tynmouth, uh, but at least able to see where the rhetoric of government crime targets met the reality of modern policing on the streets. <clears throat> so I was able to report back to Marsham Street on the stupidity of, for example, offences brought to justice targets that positively encouraged the criminalisation of young people who had otherwise have benefited from a swift kick in the arse, metaphorically, uh, of course. I mean, bringing this to the attention of senior Mandarin sitting inside Zone 1, who had created many of these perverse incentives, just what a blank stare. Why is that relevant to what we're talking about today? Well, it was explained to me that I lacked the perspective, and I remember these, these comments, they're engraved on my soul, to understand why such barking targets were acceptable. It was reflected in a poor annual performance review, marking me down for having the temerity to say the emperor had no blows. Perhaps the real blob, if it exists at all, is actually composed of incompetence, mendacity, intransigence, and the dissonance between a well-heeled, centralised power base and the things that affect people's lives outside the senior common room, or the union baron's subsidised home, or the dispositions of an administrative class that worships every single form of difference apart from thought diversity. So Thurfton said that far from interfering with government priorities, the civil service will build its ancient constitutional duty, and I think we've heard some of this before, so I'm going to canter over it a bit, to advise and warn ministers about policies uh, that are likely to be unworkable. Defenders argue this is a laudable check on executive overreach, threatened by those who wish our public administration to be politicised by ideologues. Well, I've got news for the monster is already inside the castle in that respect. Uh, but I've seen scant evidence of major policy disasters where senior mandarins have asked to be instructed in writing by ministers to carry out reforms they don't believe to be in the national interest or, God forbid, resign in that principle. So the criminally stupid austerity cuts to our justice system, which has degraded our prison service into feral chaos, could only have been carried through by senior civil servants, none of whom raised a peep about this ideological vandalism, let alone walk the plank for it. But finally... Thank For you. all that, does a blob exist, I don't know, say in the form that Rudy Deutsch would recognise in, in his exhortation of the long march through the institutions to subvert them for revolution? I mean, come on, this is Britain. The only thing I can remember about common purpose meetings I attended in the 90s, the finishing school for aspiring blobettes, was the quality of the biscuit, genuinely. Civil service has huge problems, not least the imposition of neo-religious identity ideology that is diverting time and energy from delivering high-quality public services. We fail to attract and retain senior leaders who place action and delivery above virtue signaling. Uh, these are the big issues to face in the reform of our administrative class, not as emotive as the slippery, malign space alien, but arguably more obstructive. So in the end, the film of the blob was beaten by being frozen, making public service a cold house for mediocrity and woke authoritarian obsessions refocused on the citizen who pays for it is the cure. Thanks. Thank you. It'd be good, actually, to know if there's anybody out there who's in the blob, if I can uh, term it that way, and who wants to defend them, because I think that would be good. These guys shouldn't get it all their own way in terms of giving the, uh, the blob a kicking. Um, it would be useful to know if you agree with some of the critics of the blob as to what the problems are in there, and there was many sort of reasons given. It would be good to know if you thought the bill was maybe a bit uh, going a bit easy on them, and is this just a kind of political uh, problem that's projected onto the blob? So anything really that you want to pick up and ask on or make points on, uh, then feel free to. Thanks for that. That was all very um, informative. I think the, certainly the one of the key points we got a, that was got across there was the fact that ministers don't really have their departments in hand most of the time, and um, I was interested in sort of the what the panel's thoughts are on what the relationship there is between, is, the, is this the, the lack of quality in the ministers or is it the departments themselves? Sort of a chicken and or egg question there maybe. But um, to illustrate it, one brief anecdote, we, so Rory Stewart published his autobiography recently and there's this, you know, a totally absurd anecdote of when he was a foreign minister, of, uh, sort of aid minister of some kind. And he finds out, because he has experience in the Middle East, that um, what is pretty likely happening is that aid money is being given to some sort of town municipality project in Syria, which is likely essentially giving money to ISIS. Okay, and he says with some summons, "Well, no, we're not. I'm, I'm certainly not going to, um, you know, sign off on this. This is absolutely ridiculous." And they tell him, "Well, okay, we're so, a little bit. Firstly, they're very surprised that he would say this, 
And then they say, well, you're going to have to go and talk to someone else. And he essentially goes in this massive wild goose chase, first to senior civil servants, then to people at the State Department and various different, uh, you know, higher people. And eventually he's able to get it uh, to where it's sort of, it's not even, even in his control, but eventually um, it, it, it doesn't happen anymore. It's the aid money is cut off. But even this, you know, really illustrates that he was doing his very best to, to make sure that he was, you know, a, would seemingly a very obvious thing that the British government should not be giving money to ISIS for, for, for any, any reason, right? But he had to do, he had to do a huge amount to make that happen, firstly. Um, but, and yeah, at the end of his book, he same, seemingly argues essentially that the bloc should have more power. And that's pretty much his, his sort of conclusion, which is quite absurd. But I, so my, my question really is, um, yeah, is, is it the minister or is it the blob? Okay. Thank you. Yes. So I'm about to join the civil service. How do I avoid being absorbed into the blob? <laughs> is it something that can be solved from within or does it have to be external government that removes the blob? Okay. No one ever said that Battle of Ideas didn't contain careers advice. Um, kind of thinking there's a lot of um, categories of interpretation over the years to describe something like this phenomenon. I'm thinking of James Burnham's uh, managerial revolution, uh, the kind of idea of the new class, which was um, beloved of the neoconservatives in the 1970s, um, the idea of the PMC, and, and dare I say it, um, the deep stage. So all of these kind of ideas are kind of floating out there to describe, I guess, the kind of ideology and I guess also the class interests of administrators, bureaucrats, state officials. So I'm just kind of wondering how this kind of idea of the blob kind of fits in or could perhaps kind of draw upon those kind of um, traditions of interpretation. Okay, thank you. And final one for now, probably right at the back. Hi. Um, so I want to know what constitutional reforms can be made to uh, prevent bureaucracy and quangos and the blob, um, and what mainstream populist political leaders could potentially challenge um, and actually have the strength and the courage and the backbone to stand up against these people. Okay, thanks. So let me come to uh, everyone for some answers. I mean, just on that point, uh, Poppy, if I could come to you first. Um, I mean, is this a constitutional reform question, I suppose, is is because I think if I got Bill right, then what he's saying is that there's a kind of political question here. And if there is a political question, and you, you might think it's not a political question, so feel free to argue back against that. But is is this resolvable through uh, uh, constitutional changes? Because if you t if I take the example that you gave uh, in your remarks of... of um, the lawyers been funded mm -hmm. uh, to then argue against the um, the government's uh, migration borders uh, stuff. But then is the solution to that not just political? They could leave the ECHR and then uh, go and set in place a set of policies that would take it beyond that sort of legal challenge. Mm -hmm. So are we falsely blaming the blob for some of these things? Yeah, I mean, this also kind of ties in a bit to the third question as well, which is uh, the idea of this, this problem or a lack of democratic legitimacy and the growth of this kind of nebulous third stratum, which um, sits in between you know, the, the people and governance, um, has been identified for a really long time. And that really grew out of the growth of mass politics the first half of the 20th century. That's why James Burden was writing about it so much, but also several left-wing thinkers. I mean, professional managerial class is a, is a left-wing concept, not a right-wing one. Um, what's, what's really changed fundamentally between that particular period of time and what, what we have now, what we call the blob now, and what, what I call stakeholderism, which just really isn't as catchy, but I'm, I'm going to keep trying to get that one to catch on, um, is that you know, we don't actually have mass political engagement anymore. We don't have mass political movements out in the street. A lot of these uh, blob-like movements are come about from quite unpopular um, strange legislation. Um, so, for example, we can look at the Equalities Act, which is the first one that comes to mind, for me at least. This was something that was pushed through in the dying days of New Labour, um, in the same way that Theresa May's Net Zero Act was pushed through in the dying days of her um, you know, political reign. This was not something that people were particularly agitating for, the consequences of which were not really properly understood until it was too late. The Equality Act essentially necessitated the growth of all these bureaucratic um, institutions because it set in place a certain set of, of legal requirements. Now, from these legal requirements, you get a lot of the ideological stuff coming on top. Um, another example of this would be the Charities Act, and this is something that we can't blame on Labour. This is something that came about 
from a conservative government. This was, again, the Cameroonism. It's a really nice idea. The big society is, is, was a lovely idea and it was something that was very popular in the party. It's the idea that you would revitalise this long British tradition of civil society and you would do so by empowering local communities. But what happens if you don't have local communities anymore? Um, what actually turned out to happen was you had these top-down impositions of, of what it meant to be communitarian. You know, uh, when you would have community meetings, they wouldn't be in a nice old lady, you know, drinking tea and, and eating biscuits and, you know, former veterans sitting around talking about the war. You would instead get a lot of Marxist professors and, like, die-hard activists because they were really the only people who were willing to engage in this form of mass politics anymore. So if I were to do, a, you know, a slightly contrarian, perhaps not, popular um, remedy for the blob. I mean, the best thing you could really do is not to reform it, but to slash it, to burn away at it. You don't actually need this. The Equality Act is not the Magna Carta. It is actually a very anti-British imposition. It, it does not fit at all with our, politi- um, our quite liberal, hands-off um, political traditions. So yeah, if I was you know, a populist political leader, that's probably the platform that I'd lead on, you know, slash the state. Work oh. for Liz. Yeah, okay. Well, let me come to, to you then. Um... Nick, because what one of the things Poppy was saying there was was that there's there's a kind of lack of almost lack of a you know, people to represent in a, in 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 a sort of active relationship, which might in the past have resolved some of the thing the problems that you talked about the thing the things like um uh, the lack of impartiality. <laughs> if, if you don't have a public that you have a relationship with, then it seems to me to be quite a difficult thing to have a a kind of to, to exercise loyalty in that sense of a duty to the public. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are some pretty big picture things going on. I mean, I think, I think it's right, you know, there isn't, there isn't a grand conspiracy. There isn't a sort of blob network doing, you know, contrived blob-like things. But I do think there's, um, when I talk a bit about groupthink and so on, I mean, I do think that there are, you know, there is an instinctive distrust I think, you know, organizational culture is a terribly, terribly important thing, whether you're in the public sector or the private sector. And it can take years to build up an effective culture that leads to effective delivery. And it can take not actually very long at all to destroy those cultures. And, and I think what, what's, what's happening on a sort of macro level is a bit of what, what Bill was talking about, a sort of an instinctive suspicion, really, on the part, which is not unusual among technocrats who tend to believe that they know best and they're a little bit suspicious, bottom up sort of web like initiatives. Um, and uh, so they tend to try, if they have given half a chance, to construct structures that kind of limit the ability of, 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 of people to push ideas that they don't necessarily a- agree with. To sort of people who are about to join the civil service, I mean, I would say, you know, as ever with the civil service, there's lots of great stuff on paper. The civil service code is brilliant. I mean, the trouble is, it's not really, it's being observed in the breach. And uh, a lot of my serving civil service friends, and because I'm so bloody old now, a lot of sort of retiree type friends, you know, uh, they all pretty much espouse the same kind of views. They all thought that Boris Johnson was absolutely terrible. They all absolutely hated Brexit. I had people coming up to me after the Brexit vote saying, hey, Nick, I, uh, you know, I actually voted for Brexit. Can't say anything about it. And uh, in my former department, there were notes going around saying, don't persecute people who you suspect might be a Brexiteer. So um, do they just need to grow a bit of spine? I well, I, 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 just, I, I just think that, um, you know, the, point I'm trying to make is that whatever conspiracy or lack of conspiracy theory you have, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, this country, for better or for worse, has won its right to make its own decisions about what it wants to do, which I personally think is a good thing. Um, but, um, you know, the proof of the pudding lies in the quality of the decisions that are coming out of government. And uh, I think as Lord Frost said in a, a previous debate, you know, we've probably got to the stage where we need to take a, a reasonably critical look at how a kind of essentially a 19th century structure um, needs to be updated um, to, 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 to get us into a position where, where, frankly, government is producing a better quality of decision. 
Let me bring Bill in. And, and anything that you want to pick up on, Bill? Or... Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the, I, I think Mick raises an important point about the relationship between government and the public and um, mistrust. Uh, but let's be clear, you know, the people they mistrust most is us. And um, because they no longer view the public as a public of equals in search of common solutions to, or, you know, to general problems, rather they view you all as self-interested, antagonistic atoms needing to be controlled. And therefore you see a shift from a civil service that ought to, uh, uh, and had an ethos of acting as public servants to ones that look to control and manage a country. That, that's a very different outlook. Um, and in that regard, you can see that, you know, every, and that's infected every department of government, every department of government is meant to have a useful service that they provide to the nation or to the economy or, or whatever, but necessarily it always also had certain control functions and control elements. Now it's tipped over such that the control functions dominate over the provision of useful services. So you find situations where, you know, there are more people involved in vetting adults that work in proximity with children than there are actually delivering children's services. That becomes, you know, the problem that you're looking at. So, but having said that, and I'll just finish on this point for now, there's an element, you know, I don't, don't mean to be mean, but you know, we deserve it. You know, it's like, because when a generation of people disengage from the political process, as large percentages of people did in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, the dissolution of the political difference between left and right, the very boring politics that came after that in the mid and late 90s of, you know, looking for the center ground that led to large percentages of most Western democracies disengaging from the political process. Now we're moved on, you know, another 20 years to the point where government effectively dismisses us because we're not the agents that we ought to be um, demanding um, public servants. Um, Ian, if anything that you want to pick up on, but just on the points that Bill's making, I mean, I, I remember when I was uh, working in um, the Department of Local Government and Communities, and one of the very notable things was that uh, the extent to which civil servants became almost like the bosses within the, the, the civil service, uh, they, were, they were basically... I mean, I'm not saying telling ministers what to do, but ministers were, there was definitely a subservient element of ministers to civil servants. Sure. So sure. is it something more than just the kind of, um, the, the stupidity or whatever of civil servants, which was a little bit what you were indicating? Sure. In I mean, and th that speaks to the first question that was asked, um, who's culpable minister or blob? Um, and sometimes they deserve each other, frankly. Um, I, I, the perfect example I have is a minister of the crown who is now, the, I believe, the financial secretary to the Treasury, but when she was prisons minister, uh, giving a, 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 either a written or verbal answer, I saw it in Hansard, saying that um, because a, a trans female prisoner had achieved a gender recognition certificate uh, and who was biologically male in every other respect and a sex offender, it was legally impossible for the prediction of further sexual offences for men to be used to establish that person's dangerousness on release. Now, that minister had been handed a piece of gibberish, frankly, uh, by a civil servant and had chosen to say it. I have no idea whether she understood what she was saying or not. So, we, you know, we've got, we've got to have ministers, first of all, of the calibre who will be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, deal with this, this um, hollowing out that's, that's occurred. Uh, you know, governing is very, very complex at the moment. Some ministers don't have the intellectual bandwidth. Some ministers literally don't have, in terms of the, you know, the purview of their, their uh, duties, the, the ability to, to concentrate very much, and they must rely on high-quality advice. So to answer the third question, finally, the, about you know, would constitutional reform work? Yeah, maybe in about 25 or 30 years. Uh, you know, this has come upon us you know, gradually, then suddenly. And I think the only way, if you want to actually deal with it, would get focus back on delivering public services, and this is very controversial, is to have political appointments running uh, government agencies rather than uh, you know, sinecured, time-served civil servants. 
with total accountability who will walk the plank if they're not delivering for the public. I think that would deliver a more immediate step change uh, in civil service culture, which you know, to some extent has been completely subverted by the things we've been talking about. Okay. I remain to be convinced that constitutional change is going to solve a deep-seated political problem, but maybe someone's got uh, uh, views on that. Maybe I'm wrong on that. So let's get another bunch of questions. Hi. So there's a report called um, Navigating the Labyrinth. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's about um, gaining promotion in the civil service. And it was done by the civil service. And they found that in terms of who climbs the ladder best, it's always the same sort of people from the same sort of background. And this report was suggesting that that's not a great idea because, you know, you get groupthink um, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, if that is the case, then they are coming up with the same ideas and have the same values. I've also seen it argued that although impartiality is part of the code, that in fact, as a civil servant, to be impartial is amoral because, bear with me, that makes you a bystander to terrible things that are unfolding that are perhaps you know, in your remit or your wheelhouse or whatever. So I think there's a misunderstanding of what impartiality actually means. And I think a lot of the people who are coming through, perhaps having come through the university system such as it is, see themselves as having a moral responsibility to inflict their values on, on, on other people. And so I think it's no surprise that we, we have it. But I wonder, as a, as a final service to the public, if any of you would be tempted to perhaps come up with a... a Revisit impartiality, perhaps, and 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 maybe maybe sell that to the to the civil service as um as something perhaps there should be further training and definition on. I understand what you're saying, Bill, about um you know perhaps we're to blame for some of this, but I, I just want to put an emphasis on another way in which I think the political class is is to blame, which I don't think has been stressed enough, which is that. Well, well, if you take if you take the conventional, I'm not saying everyone's been saying it here, but if you take the conventional criticism of the blob is that they've got too much power over the politicians that they can block things and so on. The kind of argument to say is that the civil service hasn't hasn't got enough authority, and that that's you know part of the problem, and that's a political problem because I think the the the, the reason that the civil service has been uh, you know denuded and hollowed out. Is that decision taken or increasingly taken since sort of the late 80s of, of outsourcing of authority, not to the civil service, but away from government, away from the state into the private sector? And I think that the cumulative effect of that has been to undermine the authority and therefore to undermine, you know, the, the old public service ethos. I mean, why be loyal to your minister if you've not really got any uh, responsibilities? You know, when you find yourself at a meeting with, with your minister and there's, uh, you know, 25 year old consultants from EY there telling you what to do. You haven't got a clue. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you're told, well, you've got to follow these people because they are the experts, they are the professionals, you know, then, then why be loyal? You know, why be, you know, pride yourself on being professional and, uh, and being objective and so on. So in a sense, I think it's another way of saying the political problem is that the state collectively has been outsourced, uh, avoided responsibility. And so perhaps, you know, one way, I'm not saying it's a constitutional answer, but if we reverse that and have a greater clarity as to what the role of the public is, as opposed to the role of the private sector, you know, stopped all this outsourcing, then perhaps we'd be able to, you know, rebuild a professional civil service who can actually then be a base for, for, for coming up with some, you know, innovative ideas. So another way of looking at the public-private blurring as being the problem. Nick was saying that, um, yeah, it's not a conspiracy. I, I agree. It's not a conspiracy. A conspiracy is tricking people about something you don't believe in. It's a religion. They really believe in it. it it's, it's their ultimate concern. And I think it was Durkheim who, who defined religion as your ultimate concern. And beyond duty and Im impartiality and democracy, their ultimate concern is, is, as we were saying, identity politics, diversity, equity, the things under this belief system of, of progressivism. And, and, and the, um, the first article of the religion of progressivism is, oh, our, our beliefs aren't a religion. Everyone else's beliefs are religion. Our beliefs transcend mm -hmm. the old religions, the old bigotries. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in a world of self-indulgence, progressivism is a religion that gives you a shortcut to the moral high ground where you can look down on everyone else from your high perch. And I'm afraid we've, um, um, we've, 
left us um, our Christianity and we become religiously illiterate and so we don't recognize a religion when it stares us in the face. Not, long, not much more than a year ago, Liz Truss won the premiership with a two-thirds majority over Rishi Sunak. And her and Kwasi Kwarteng came into their post and they were critical of Treasury orthodoxy. They wanted to push aside Tom Scholar. And then other things happened. That they, that they made the, the energy help, which ran between anything between 40 and 160 billion. The markets didn't really move. Um, they floated a few of their ideas with the mini budget, uh, the corporation tax, national insurance wasn't a surprise. The, the surprise in their mini budget amounted, amounted to about five billion pounds. Um, but the market spooked. Bond yields went up. The Bank of England seemed to be working in the opposite direction. And Liz Truss was told by somebody that she had to replace her chancellor with the one person that she would be least likely to make chancellor. I'd love to know who that person was. Um, and then Rishi Sunak becomes prime minister. And I think it was Guy Hans tweeted that the hedge funds have got their first prime minister. My question is, did the civil service take part in a coup? Okay. And my question would be, is that a conspiratorial question? So let's just kind of look at it both ways. Yes, who's, who's got it now? Uh, yeah, in follow-up to your gentleman's question there, uh, and the idea that there's absolutely nothing conspiratorial about it. No, it's a question, yeah. Uh, just asking for an idea of the role of the central bank that they play with regard to all of this, because it's very rarely discussed how, how they interact the rest of society and how they influenced uh, the way the way that uh, the whole system operates and the level of control they have over everything. But you can quite certainly, clearly see over the last three years what is running this system: the security services and the central banks, and everything else runs off that. That is your operating mechanism, and a system of control is bullying, bribery, and blackmail. And all the people we see are puppet. And you can see that now. They can't even remain on the stage for any length of time before they have to retire for family reasons, for this, for that. They know they're lying. We know they're lying. Everyone can see it. When okay. somebody can admit. All right. Thanks. So, Ian, can I pick up. You can pick up on everything. Right. So yep. just give us a few... Okay. Uh, uh, couple of quicks, sure, just a in, minute's worth of thoughts. Sure. In reverse order, Central Bank, my first job was for Coots & Co. I must have been a diversity hire because I was sacked in six months be, be, by being illiterate and numerate, so I can't answer that. Uh, conspiracy versus cock-up, I'm far more convinced cock-up uh, is the predominant theme of how we are dysfunctional in our public services. Very interesting question about um, outsourcing authority to the private sector. And I think that absolutely is taking place too much. I remember working for the Youth Justice Board. There was a million pound contract with Cap Gemini or one of those people. The only thing I can ever remember getting from them that was of any use was the fruit they used to put on slates when I went to the, the meetings when they filled their heads with gibberish and PowerPoint presentations. Not nothing substance delivered. And, and finally, I think that the question was asked about um, impartiality. I think impartiality is very different from neutrality, okay? The civil service needs to be impartial, but it needs to also reflect the values of this country, and it needs to reflect the values of the government in charge who are democratically elected, and it shouldn't be neutral. It can be uh, impartial, it can fill it, fulfill its function to advise and warn, but I don't think we've got anywhere close to that in, in recent years. We probably need to try to restore it somehow. Poppy. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm going to be talking about the civil service as well. Um, I did actually apply when I was at university and I didn't even get past the initial quiz stage, which I think was quite remarkable. Of all the people I knew that applied, um, it was pretty much a box ticking exercise and I did so poorly I didn't even get there. So now, it's sour grapes then. So yes, this is sour grapes. I will never forget. Um, I, it's interesting, this, this conception of representation, because you can kind of track how the civil service has changed over time. Um, I read a book last year when the, all of the Dominic Raab stuff is going on. I, I've just remembered it. Roger Knight's Britain Against Napoleon. 
which I know it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the civil service, but it, it really does. And what's quite remarkable is reading about how these, these young men who are existing in a um, in an administrative state, not really the civil service as we conceived it of now, but they face the same sort of problem. So in the 1790s, the British administrative state was absolutely notorious for having people come basically clocking out of work early, um, not keeping track of accounts, so like screwing everything over. And what Knight tries to argue is that when this administrative state was taken over by like a very small group of young men who walked the work themselves to exhaustion and in many cases suicide, I mean, they were so hardworking basically given complete power to do what they wanted and they, they transformed it. And that was the edge that we had um, over Napoleon. But, but anyway, so the idea again of, of representation, if you, if you do track this, I'd say initially um, the British administrative state was run on prerogative. This then changed to patronage. Um, then with certain reforms, the ones we know about now is meritocracy, this idea of people rising up on merit. And now representation is the highest value that we seek out for. Now, I would say in the last 20 or 30 years when representation has based, is really been explicitly presented as what we've been looking for, this has not been a good time for administration. I'm not necessarily sure the constant pursuit of diverse thought and the constant pursuit of representing the British electorate is really what people want. I think what people would probably want is, is competence. And again, this idea of neutrality. I mean, we all know that liberal neutrality is, is just a convenient fiction. This is something that we've been aware of for a very long time. Uh, I, I do think to a certain extent expecting people to bind themselves to it is probably a lost cause. But if you are, you know, like me, a conservative, it's kind of the last thing you have to hold on to. At least explicitly you can point something out. But it, that can only last for so long. Again, the Dominic Raab situation, you can complain all you like, people are coming after you. But if your solution to this is to write an op-ed in The Telegraph, then what's the point of having you elected as an official? You know, you have to also be willing to wield your power so yeah, um, sorry, rambling away, but a few thoughts on the civil service. No, that's, that's useful, I think. Um, Nick? Um, yes, just going back to what the lady in the front row was saying. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, as I say, it, we are looking at issues of organisation, culture. Uh, we're not necessarily looking at conspiracy. Uh, and I, I agree with Ian, I'm cock up rather than uh, conspiracy myself. But there are caveats. I, I do think there's an issue around sort of HR producing, I think, a very uniform group of people who tend to have the same outlook, the same attitude. They're sort of evaluator monitors. They're, they're switched around from post to post. And when the shit hits the fan, they don't really know what to do because they aren't rooted in their particular department. They aren't experts. They don't have a reputation amongst the troops below them for being delivery people in their particular area of expertise. They're just wonderfully intelligent generalists, and that doesn't necessarily work. I mean, so, you know, there are lots of wonderful, decent, intelligent people around, but they're not delivering the outcomes that the country needs. I think it's the point I'm making. And on, um, on, the, on, the, trust, on the trust car crash, I mean, I think um, it, it wasn't a conspiracy, but equally, trust should have known that she was going driving it straight into a minefield. I mean, she'd been in the cabinet for, for long enough. And she just blew herself up. Um, but there are questions around Bank of England competence, the fact that they didn't understand what leverage derivative investments were doing, uh, that, that you know their forecasts were rubbish, OBR forecasts aren't particularly good. There are questions, as Ian says, of competence here around, you know, uh, so, so it's not, it, I'm picking up on what Poppy, Poppy was saying, it's not conspiracy, it's cock up or lack of competence. Okay, very often. Bill. Um, at the end of, uh, after Kemi Badenoch had done her speech in the Commons about critical race theory, it's very interesting that uh, a black um, charity wrote a letter pointing out that they were very disappointed because she had put the agenda, in, in their words, made it toxic through party politics. And there's an element where it's precise, it's politics that they don't want, that they are desperately trying to avoid. They view it, they prefer to view it as a purely technical discussion. It's really important to understand that because it's like, we're political agents. You know, it, again, it goes back to the point I made about rejecting us. And, but that's been a long time in Genesis. Uh, in 1918, at the end of the First World War, Woodrow Wilson, the American president, made his famous 14 points speech where he pointed out that 
part of the reason for the First World War had been the fact that people make huge foreign policy decisions behind closed doors without the public being able to see what's going on and being engaged. We know, we think of that period romantically as one of a great flourishing of democracy. The franchise was extended to women and many other groups in society who'd never had the opportunity to vote before. What did the people at the top think at the time? The last thing they wanted was ordinary people to make decisions. So why are they opening up the doors of parliament to you and me? Well, at the same time is when they started setting up the central banks that somebody's referred to, unelected presidents, constitutional courts, commissions of experts, of which the EU is probably the biggest and best example, everything to move political decision-making out of the political arena. So you have the superficially, the veneer of living in a democratic society whilst all the decisions uh, are being made behind closed doors. Okay, so final round of questions then. Okay, so my question is about um, the super blurb in the US, uh, because you alluded, you know, there's lots of dark rooms there. Um, But one of the things that the super blurb, the the federal um, agencies, they have a stability. So no matter what the government is of the day or the president, they continue running in a very consistent way. And the consistency is perhaps the most important thing about the blob. And in fact, one of the problems I think that you're alluding to with, with British, the British blob is that it's, it's once consistency But, and it has never been perfect because, I mean, if you look at the blob years, you know, the ministries, you know, up just after the war, they, they weren't all perfect. And, you know, they had, um, I mean, they did believe in what the government of the day, particularly Labour government were, um, wanted them to do and they 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 did follow that really well, well actually a, a lot of the discussion around the, in that post-war period was how civil servants were undermining a labor government oh it, so it was, was uh, a, a, well, that's interesting because i would like to hear that you know that it's not perfect now was it perfect then is it perfect in the u.s where you know um you know the, the three are we in then not it never going to be in a nirvana is i guess my question Ian pointed out that ministers can lack intellectual bandwidth and so needed high quality advice. But if the blob is senior, non elected, and barely accountable officials influencing the implementation of national policy and expenditure, do senior politicians think non elected spads influencing policy implementation and finance are a solution? Nick mentioned uh, a 19th century system of government um, in Scotland. We've got a 30 year old um, parliament and we've not got less of a problem there. What was that, that final bit? We've not got less of a problem there and it's only a 30 year old parliament. Say considerably more of a blob actually. Um, yes. So I want to, uh, ask a question to Poppy specifically, because I know that she's done a lot of, um, writing about this. So in, in America, um, they've talked a lot about this problem over there. They call it the cathedral. Um, what I, what I'm getting at is that, I mean, the American rights, uh, they, they have a whole sort of network of their own policy makers, their own sort of political staff that they've built up over the years. They've realized, you know, because of with Trump, um, that was all thwarted. They're now talking about, you know, uh, schedule there. Uh, the American mind did something, uh, I think it was called, um, uh, I forgot, I've forgotten what it was called, but uh, they, you know, Chris Rufo, Richard Hinania, all these people, they're really thinking about, uh, yeah, how do we actually restructure government? My question is, I mean, particularly with Liz Truss and how everything sort of was against her, how can the conservatives use this period in opposition? to maybe build something similar, build like an alternative, um, power structure, because as Aris Rao Sinos in Unheard said, we don't have that. We don't, that's a disadvantage that the British right has, that we don't have that kind of network that the Americans have. Okay. Do you want to just answer that? 
and then we'll just do a final round of sort of summing up comments. Um, something specific, if you want. Yeah, no, um, just paying off against that that last one. You're completely right. Um, the American kind of conservative movement is, is, I would say, a lot more mature than the British one, and and I say that even with the slightly different context. I mean, the most obvious one is one of the reasons why these alternative networks have been able to be built up is because of funding, money. There's a lot more money in right-wing politics in America in a way that just isn't really here. Um, you know, the most obvious example, I would think, would be um, the Heritage Foundation have recently invested in a massive scheme yeah, to, massive like, charge. when we retake power, how do we avoid the mistakes of the Trump administration, right, where we were tangled up in the swamp, as it were. Um, and uh, a lot of them play on these, like, quite uh, interesting and and sometimes quite esoteric um, political ideologies, like uh, Strauss is like a, someone who's regularly uh, discussed in the American right, and we're still stuck talking about Burke, um, which I, I, I would say probably doesn't you know, speak very well for us. Um, you're right that we do need to build up alternative networks, but I think the first way you start doing that is you have to break away from an old style of conservatism, which is just inherently intellectually wedded to the idea of the old and of the institution. I, I, I would... Um, take Michael Oakeshott's maxim of, you know, preferring the, the tried to the untried or the old to the new, but it, however it goes, um, it, it's bad and not something that really works to respond to the problems that we have politically today. So I'd say it's vital, but where's money? Okay. So is there any final, final, final questions before I go to the panel for their summing up? Okay. Well, um, I think we'll go in reverse order this time. So start with you, Ian, and just give us a kind of minutes worth of thoughts just to take away something to uh, remember the discussion by and something to guide us in the future. Okay, and, and can I say thank you to you for your really good questions, very thoughtful uh, um, questions, and my colleagues here for very thoughtful presentations. Um, I, I'm going to be really brief, uh, unusually. Um, I, I think we have a, a what I would a, a term a, a mediocrity, a boss class that has been long in the making of people who all think the same and who cannot tolerate, tolerate thought diversity, who are, uh, find, uh, you know, um, nothing invented anywhere else, antithetical, who are insular. And I'm talking about the, the senior echelons of the civil service. We've got a real problem here with, um, democratic accountability. Um, and that is the issue. And, and that's the thing that needs to be fixed. We have an accountability deficit. Nobody ever takes any responsibility for anything anymore, for colossal failures. People are promoted upwards or out of the way. That is a really entrenched culture. And if we want fundamental change in how our public services are delivered, we shouldn't be looking for conspiracies because I don't believe they exist. So the blob is actually a whole pile of mini blobs, if you like. But for me, competence and accountability are, are the key things that need to be uh, or their, their reverse needs to be vanquished. And I think one of the ways of doing so, it's very controversial, but we need to at least start talking about that, is having political appointments to run government agencies instead of time-served sinecures of people who all think the same. Okay. Controversial remark to finish with. Uh, Bill? Um, I'm not sure political appointments will necessarily work because I, I suppose part of my thesis is uh, a lot of these individuals don't even know what it is that they think in the first place and are unable to articulate it um, coherently. A, a great example of that is if you want to, if you think that the Equality Act is the barrier preventing you from introducing guidelines in schools for how to deal with trans pupils, you've been in government for 13 years. You've had 13 years to reform the Equality Act. Um, so that sense of powerlessness that ministers claim of, you know, ruling a void or, you know, that every book that comes out at the moment has got that kind of hollow title in it, you know, that there's this kind of inability to connect. That's the problem. There, there, there's an inability to connect with us. Um, and we have to start taking ourselves very seriously if we're going to make government act in the interest of the public. The, the problem is there is no coherent public with a well-articulated, confrontational or challenging voice. Um, and the consequences of that is that everything's done along, you know, kind of, to some extent, self-interested lines, um, to some extent, just lines that don't know where they're going. Okay, thank you. Poppy. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think 
kind of take away from this discussion is that we all seem to feel to a certain extent that Britain is is facing a pretty major legitimacy crisis, yes. which is really what this comes down to. It's, it's not just competence. It's the idea that you can keep pulling a lever over and over and over again, in some cases for decades, and you will not get the policy outcomes that you want. And this is just not a sustainable situation. I don't believe that things will just gradually degenerate and degenerate and we'll all be fine. I think this is tearing the country apart. If we only have to look over to our continental European neighbours, I mean, look at the rhetoric around what the European Union like was in 2016. This was the idea of this liberal bastion where liberalism and democracy were still quite intertwined. Well, now look at Europe in 2023. It's, it's tearing itself apart. The idea that we are somehow immune from this, I think, is a historical and, and, and wishful thinking. So, you know, it's more vital now than ever to really address this crisis. And I'd say particularly for the Conservative government, which is now looks like it's going to be out of power for at least a, a, a significant period of time. Now is the time to regroup and think, if we do get into power, what are the first principles upon which we are trying to, um, you know, advocate for? What is our ideology and how do we get it done? If we are going to dismantle this administrative state, how are we going to go about doing that? Now is not the time to just be complaining and moaning that you can't do things. Um, so, yes, it's an interesting next decade coming up for us. Nick? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm going to violently agree with what the rest of the panel have said. I mean, the bottom line is the system isn't delivering. Uh, the outcomes aren't good. Um, and, yeah, Bill's absolutely right. You know, the Tory party's had a, a chance for 13 years and can't. it's such a broad church that it can't work out what it wants and uh, what it actually uh, agrees on. Um, and I also completely uh, agree with Ian that, you know, ultimately what we're looking for, well, we're looking for good quality decisions that, 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 that reflect sort of competence. And I think accountability is, is important. I think the old system we had relied on um, cultural assumptions that, that whether we like it or not, no longer exist. And uh, I think Francis Maud is doing a, a review at the moment around uh, possible civil service reform. And uh, the Institute for Government, I think, thinks it's all great, except for the idea of possible political appointees, which they, they're violently opposed to. But I, I think Ian is right that one of the solutions may well be to inject a level of accountability into the upper echelons of the civil service. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's the fact that we've got to, uh, it isn't about conspiracies. It's, it's a collective recognition that we could just be doing a whole lot better and we should be looking forwards, not back and trying to, and I know Munira Mirza has tried to do that with her civic forum group. It's just trying to get us into a better place where collectively we make better and more accountable decisions for the benefit of the voter. Can we thank the panel, please?